<laughs> Those of you who have seen the movie Horton, here's a few who know what it's about. Essentially, Horton, this elephant, sees a speck of dust. He hears things from this speck of dust, and he says, hey, I think there's something inside there. I think there's people inside there. Uh, nobody believes him. Nobody, nobody buys into that at all. So we get this speck of dust. Uh, as far as everybody else is concerned, a speck of dust is a speck of dust. It doesn't get any smaller than a speck of dust. That's as small as it gets. But as far as Horton is concerned, there's something else. There's something smaller than a speck of dust. We can look inside that speck of dust and find these little people running around, these who's running around inside this, this speck of dust. In 1897, J.J. Thompson, and you, you recognize that name from Science 10, when we talked about the, the pump pudding model of the atom, probably in Chemistry 20 as well. J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. Prior to 1897, we had the Dalton solid sphere model of the atom, which says basically that the atom is the atom. The atom is the speck of dust. There's nothing smaller than that. Okay, you got a bunch of specks of dust, you make up whatever. You got a bunch of atoms, you make up whatever. But there's nothing inside that atom. There's nothing smaller than that atom. There's no who's. There's no whoville inside this, inside this atom. Prior to 1897, Prior to 1897, um, we said exactly the same thing about the atom as we said about, as, as, uh, as most people at least, said about the speck of dust. There's nothing smaller inside. Well, J.J. Thompson is our Horton here. J.J. Thompson comes along and says, yeah, no, I think there is something smaller than that, than that atom. There is something smaller than that speck of dust. There's little people inside the speck of dust called who's. There's these little tiny charged particles called the electrons inside the atom. For the first time, we have definitive proof that the atom is not fundamental. There is something smaller than the atom, just like there is something smaller than that speck of dust. Thompson used something called the cathode ray tube to discover this electron. A cathode ray tube um, has been around since the mid-1800s. Thompson didn't invent this cathode ray tube at all, any more than when you watch TV you invent the cathode ray tube. You simply use a cathode ray tube when you watch TV. At least when you use one of the older style TVs, you use a cathode ray tube. That's all Thompson did too. He used a cathode ray tube that had been invented by somebody else 50 years before that. He used it to discover this electron. The inside of a cathode ray tube, or a TV, and that's where we've used cathode tubes recently, right, is televisions. The inside of it looks something like this. Now, this looks a little bit confusing. We're going to simplify this in just a moment. I'm not going to ask you to write this down. I'll ask you to copy it as I do this simplification, okay? Basically, though, it consists of three chambers, what we call the acceleration chamber, and that's where electrons, as we now know them to be, accelerate to a really, really high speed. And then they go through this what I call the velocity selection chamber here, where we have an electric field and we have a magnetic field. And then, after that, they go through what we call the main chamber, which is where they end up bending and hitting the screen. Right? That's, the, that's the picture that you see on the TV screen is where the electrons end up hitting the screen. We bend them, we change the path by this magnetic field. Now, I'm going to draw this again, but I'm going to draw it one section at a time. Here's a cross-section of the cathode ray tube. This is basically... Your, your picture tube okay, in an old-style TV. Okay, the piece of glass that you see in front of that TV right now is this. Okay, this is the screen. That screen is painted with a, with a coating, a phosphorescent coating. When something hits it, it lights up. Okay, we see a glowing spot when something hits it. Now, at the other end of this tube, this cathode ray tube, we have a power supply hooked up to a couple of electrodes. This electrode over here we call the cathode. And this electrode over here we call the anode. In 1897, and even prior to 1897, lots of people, including Thompson, saw something leaving this cathode. This mysterious ray leaving this cathode. What is it? Nobody really knew what it was. They called them cathode rays because they came from the cathode. 
They went through this little hole in the anode, came down here and struck this screen, and we were able to determine where they struck the screen by looking at where it glows. That, in its most basic form, is the cathode ray tube. Now, what did Thompson do to this cathode ray tube to be able to discover the electron? Well, the first thing he did, beyond what you see up on the board here, was to introduce a magnetic field. The magnetic field he introduced was down here. That magnetic field caused this cathode ray, this mysterious beam of unknown whatever, to change path. It was going straight, and it did hit this phosphorescent screen straight on right here. But now it starts going down like this. That led Thompson to a conclusion. Still, not enough information to allow him to discover the electron, but it's something. His conclusion from this was that these cathode rays, these mysterious beams coming from the cathode of this experiment, are really negatively charged particles. Now, the logical question that a lot of people have at this point is, well, if we didn't know about electrons, how did we know that negative particles were deflected in this way by a magnetic field? We knew about charge. We knew about charge for years and years and years and years before that. Charge wasn't new. The idea of positive charge wasn't new here in 1897. The idea of negative charge wasn't new. The idea of where that charge came from was new. The idea that it came from electrons and whatever was new. At this point, Thompson just simply sees these beams, these cathode rays, deflecting downwards in this magnetic field. And that tells him, by the hand rule for deflection, that they must be negatively charged particles. Again, that's something. But Thompson wasn't satisfied with that. He wanted to know more about these cathode rays, these beams, the mysterious rays that are striking the screen and deflected by magnetic fields. So he tried to do a mathematical analysis. He looked at this and said, well, I, I know what to do. When a charged particle goes through a magnetic field and it goes through a circular path, I know what to do. I do FC equals FM. That's exactly what we did two units ago, right? FC is equal to FM. MV squared over R is equal to QVB. We can cancel out one of the Vs here, actually. And we're left with MV over R equals Q times B. Now, Here's what Thompson was able to measure. He was able to measure quite easily the value of R. He was able to look at the screen and where these, these, these negatively charged particles hit the screen and say, oh, OK, they hit the screen down here, then the radius must be this value. Based on where they hit the screen, he was able to determine the value of R. He knew what the value of B was because he put the magnetic field there. He introduced the magnetic field. So of course he knows what its value is. What he doesn't know, though, is the value of m. How heavy are these negative particles? He had no idea. What's the speed of these negatively charged particles? No idea. What's the charge of these negatively charged particles? Well, it's negative, but how much negative? No idea. So this doesn't seem to be overly helpful. We've got five variables here. He knows two of them. He doesn't know three of them. That doesn't seem to be a very, good, a very good percentage here. So here's what he does. He introduces another section of this cathode ray tube, puts a magnetic field right here. That, if we look at the hand rule for deflection, causes a magnetic force downward on these particles, just like it did in this chamber down here. But in this one, we also introduce an electric field, the positive plate and the negative plate. That causes an electric force upwards. Now, some of these particles are going to go through this second section here, this blue section that we call the velocity selection chamber. And they're going to be deflected upwards because the electric force acting on those particles will be bigger than the magnetic force. Some of those particles will be deflected downwards because the magnetic force downwards will be bigger than the electric force. Some of these particles will go straight through because 
those two forces balance for some of the particles. The electric force upwards equals the magnetic force downward. Those are the particles we care about, the particles that go straight through. The ones that go through this velocity selection chamber, this blue section here, and then enter this main chamber, this red section here. Let's analyze those particles. Fe equals Fm. Again, only for the ones that go straight through, only for the ones that go undeflected. The electric force, as you know from three units ago, is Q times E. The magnetic force, as you know from our last uh, two units ago, I should say, is QVB. Qs cancel. V is equal to E over B. The speed of the particles that go straight through undeflected, now this isn't all of them, but the ones that go straight through, which is the ones that we care about, is equal to the electric field over the magnetic field. And Thompson could measure both of those values. Now we know the speed of the particles that are going into this main chamber here, this red chamber. So we can take that value and plug it in right here. That's one more thing we know now. Now the balance has shifted. If we go to that main chamber, that red chamber in Thompson's expression that described that, mv over r is equal to q times b, now of those five variables, he knows three. And there's only two unknowns. That's still more than we'd like, but it's OK. Let's say somebody walked into this room right now and said, how old are you? To Evan. Evan said, I'm not telling. And he said, how old are you to me? And I said, I, I don't know. I'm too old to remember. We don't know how old either one of us is, Evan or me. Now, the guy that walked into this room wanted to know the age of both of us. He couldn't find out the age of either one. But the next question he asked, we answered. What's the ratio of your ages? Uh, and Evan said, oh, Mr. Dick is two and a half times older than I am. OK, well, that's something. It would be better if we knew Evan's age and my age. But to know the ratio of my age to his age is better than nothing. Would you agree? Right, that's more information. It's less information than the guy that walked into the room wanted. But it's something, at least. He's, he walks away at least somewhat happy. Thompson couldn't find M. He had no way to find M. And he couldn't find Q. He had no way to find Q. But what he did is found the ratio between the two of them. He rearranged this to solve for the ratio, which is Q over M. The M goes down by dividing. And then the B goes to the other side by dividing. We end up with V over BR. We know V. We know B. We know R. Thompson ends up getting a number that looks something like this. 1.76 times 10 to the 11 kuoms per kilogram. That's something. That's like saying I'm two and a half times older than Evan is. Not as much as we want, but it's better than nothing. It's better than what we had before. This is where Thompson drew his conclusion from that said the atom consists of more than just the atom. There's something inside the atom, these, these little tiny electrons. This number is so big. It's really, really, really big. Other charge to mass ratios that have been measured for other particles were like 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7. This charge to mass ratio is way, way bigger than these other charge to mass ratios. That told him that if that ratio of charge to mass was so big, then the mass was going to be really, really small. A mass smaller than anything we've ever measured before. Therefore, it's not going to be an atom. It's got to be something that's smaller than an atom. It's got to be subatomic. So this number told him that we've got subatomic particles because the charge to mass ratio was so big. The fact that they were negative particles told them that they're subatomic, negatively charged particles. Call them what you want. Okay? We call them electrons. Call them what you want. In the end, they're negatively charged subatomic particles that we call electrons. Does that make some sense? This next page just gives us that conclusion right, that we already talked about. 
get negatively charged particles because of the way the particles were deflected in the magnetic field. They're subatomic. We know that because the charge to mass ratio is so big. Therefore, the mass would be so small, smaller than anything we've ever measured before. Therefore, it's got to be smaller than the atom, subatomic. Now, we're going to do a problem on this in just a second. Every time you see a problem, however, I want you to keep in mind something beyond things that we've talked about already when we see problems, okay? Up until now, I say, look, when you spot something that's kind of odd, strange units, something that you need to draw attention to, then circle it in red or highlight it or something to draw attention to it. I want you to keep doing that. Okay, that doesn't change right now. I also tell you to write down your givens or at least circle your givens and identify them. I want you to keep doing that. That doesn't change. But one other thing that you've got to do here as well, when you see these problems, you've got to identify which section of the cathode ray tube it is. Is it the main chamber, the third chamber here, this red one? Is it the velocity selection chamber, this blue one that you see right here? Identify what it is, because really what you've got here is two separate problems, a velocity selection chamber and a main chamber. Just like with any other problem, you would identify whether it's impulse or conservation of momentum or conservation of charge or the hand rule for deflection. You'd identify what it was. You've got to do that here, but you've got to identify within that main category, within that main topic of cathode ray tube, which section of the cathode ray tube it is, and then treat it as that section. If you have to do both, which occasionally you do, then make sure you do them separately. Okay, if you need to get something from the velocity selection chamber to, to solve the main chamber, then do that. But don't try to put them together. Solve the velocity selection chamber problem first, and then do the main chamber, just like you would with any other thing we've done this year if you had two separate types of problems in one. All right, let's take a look at our first example here. This one says a beam of electrons, or a, a cathode ray, passes undeflected through a 0.5 Tesla magnetic field combined with a 50 kilonewton per coulomb electric field. First thing we spot is that kilonewton per coulomb thing, because we don't want to use kilonewtons, we want to use newtons. The electric field, the magnetic field, and the velocity of the electrons are all perpendicular to each other. How fast are the electrons traveling? All right, we've got a magnetic field here. We've got an electric field here. And we're looking for the speed. Tell me, if we go back to this diagram, which section of the cathode ray tube are we dealing with here? The question said the particles are going undeflected through this electric field, this magnetic field. We want to find the speed. Is it the velocity selection chamber or is it the main chamber? Good. It's the velocity selection chamber. Now, if we look at that question again, how do you know? What told you that it's the velocity selection chamber as opposed to the main chamber here? Good. Okay, that's criteria number one. There are two things that can tell us here that it's the velocity selection chamber, and Evan just hit one of them right on the head. It's all you need. Okay, if Evan doesn't come up with the other one, that's fine, because he's already got one. He already knows that it's the velocity selection chamber. He said that the electric field and the magnetic field. If you look back at that diagram, there's only one of these sections that has an electric field and a magnetic field. The other one has just magnetic. So if you see both, it's going to be the velocity selection chamber. Tell me what the other one is, though. I'll give you a hint. It's a one-word answer here. One word. Dan? Yes, undeflected. Patrick, is that what you were going to say? Yes. It's undeflected. Okay, in the main chamber, they're going in a circle, right, with a certain radius. In the velocity selection chamber, they're going undeflected straight through. So either one of those will tell us that this is a velocity selection chamber question. Let's derive the equation each and every time we get a problem like this, because the equation that I put up on the board, v is equal to e over b, isn't actually on your data sheet. You're going to either have to remember it or derive it each time. The electric force is q times e. That's on your data sheet. The magnetic force is qvb. That's also on your data sheet. Let's put them together, cancel out a q, and solve for V here. It becomes E over B. Now, the electric field is 50 kilonewtons per coulomb, or 50,000. 50 times 10 to the 3 newtons per coulomb. 
the magnetic field is 0 0.50 Tesla. That should give us 1.0 times 10 to the 4. 10 to the 5. 1.0 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. I should have actually guessed 10 to the 5 because that's a much more common answer. 10 to the 5 than 10, than 10 to the 4. 10 to the 4 is possible, but 10 to the 5 is a lot more a lot more frequent as an answer. So some of these particles might be traveling faster than that. Some of them might be going slower than that. But the ones that go undeflected, which are the ones we care about, are going that exact speed. Otherwise, they wouldn't be undeflected. They would either curve upwards or downward as a result of the fields. Let's try these three questions, please. Let's take a look at question number three. It says, what magnitude of magnetic field will stop ions from being deflected while they move at a speed of 75 kilometers per second through an electric field of the magnitude of 150 newtons per coulomb? What section of the cathode ray tube are we dealing with in question number three here? Is it the main chamber? Is it the velocity selection chamber? And how do we know? How do you know? Good. OK, good. Um, Tanner says it's a velocity selection chamber because it's got both electric and a magnetic field. Okay, that's all you need. If you got both of those, it's a velocity selection chamber. Now, the other thing that can tell you if you didn't spot that, like Tanner did, is the fact that we're, we're saying that we want to stop these ions from being deflected. In other words, we want to make them undeflected. Either one of those things will tell us it's the velocity selection chamber. Okay, let's circle this because it's odd units. Uh, let's Make that our speed. Let's make that our electric field. And of course, we want to find our magnetic field, V. So we're going to say uh, Fe. Don't ever set the fields equal to each other. Never. Okay, not in this context or any other context. Set forces equal to each other. Fe equals Fm. Don't try doing this. Okay, that will be wrong every single time in this context or any other context. It's got to be force equals force. OK, the electric force, Q times the electric field. The magnetic force, QV times the magnetic field. V ends up being equal to E over B, which in this case, we actually want to solve for B. So we'll take the V over by dividing. It becomes E over V. OK, now we do that math. E is 150, V is 75 times 10 to the 3, because we need meters per second, not kilometers per second. We end up getting 2.0 times 10 to the negative 3. How many people got that one? Okay. Let's try another one here. This one says a beam of electrons as we now know them. Okay, prior to 1897, we would have just called them cathode rays. When this beam of electrons is accelerated to a speed of 5.93 times 10 to the 5, it's directed to a uniform perpendicular to a uniform 100 micro Tesla magnetic field. They travel on a circular path of radius 3.37 centimeters. What's the charge to mass ratio for the electron? Charge to mass ratio is Q over M, right? Q divided by M, that's what we want to find here. Which section are we dealing with here? The velocity selection chamber or the main chamber? It's the main chamber, right? Let's go back to our picture. The main chamber of the cathode ray tube involves only a magnetic field, not electric and magnetic. That question involved only a magnetic field. The main chamber involves the charged particles going in a circular path. That question involves the charged particles going in a circular path. This is, for sure, the main chamber. In the main chamber, we're going to say Fc is equal to Fm, because they go in a circle. mv squared over r equals qvb. Uh, v's cancel. You get mv over r equals q times b. Now, we have to rearrange this to solve for q over m, the charge to mass ratio. The m goes down to the right side by dividing. The b goes down to the left side by dividing. 
So we end up with q over m is equal to v over b times r. The speed here was given to us as 5.93 times 10 to the 5 meters per second. The magnetic field is 100 times 10 to the minus 6 Tesla. And the radius is 0 0.0337 meters. Let's do the math on this one together here. Let's say 5.93 times 10 to the 5. Divide that by, let's use some brackets here, 100 times 10 to the minus 6 times 0 0.0337. We get uh, 1.76 times 10 to the 11. Hey, what did I tell you when we first did, first introduced this concept? What did I tell you the charge to mass ratio for this cathode ray was? 1.76 times 10 to the 11. Okay, that shows that it's a beam of electrons. What are the units there? Charge over mass, what are the units? Coulombs per kilogram, charge over mass, right? Let's try the three questions that go along with that, please. Let's take a quick look at question number three. It says, a carbon-12 ion has a charge to mass ratio of 8.04 times 10 to the 6 coulombs per kilogram. Calculate the radius of the ion's path when it travels at 150 kilometers per second perpendicular to a 0.5 Tesla magnetic field. This is the main chamber because we're dealing with something that has just a magnetic field and we're looking for the radius. No other section has a radius other than the main chamber. So it is a main chamber, but we've got a bit of an issue here in the sense that this carbon-12 ion is not an electron. It's not really a cathode ray 2 problem. This is what we call a mass spectrometer problem. A mass spectrometer is pretty much the same thing as a cathode ray tube, except that we're dealing with um, ions as opposed to electrons. What we'll do in a mass spectrometer is to take an unknown sample, an unknown material, ionize it, and then determine its properties using the cathode, sorry, sorry, using the mass spectrometer, and then identify what it is. So it's a way to identify an unknown material using a mass spectrometer. Okay? Here, our unknown material would be this carbon-12 ion that we're running through this. It works exactly the same way. The analysis goes exactly the same way. We're just obviously going to get different numbers for this. Uh, take note of something else here. We have a charge to mass ratio of 8.04 times 10 to the 6. I don't know if anybody caught this or not, but the charge to mass ratio of the electron, we said, was 1.76 times 10 to the 11. This is way bigger than the charge to mass ratio of a carbon ion or of any other ion for that matter. Remember we said that was one of the things that led Thompson to the conclusion that these things are negatively charged subatomic particles? The charge to mass ratio is so big compared to the charge to mass ratio of other things that have been found? Look, it's 10 to the 5 times bigger. It's 100,000 times bigger than the charge to mass ratio of a carbon ion. Okay, this has got to be so small that it's subatomic. It's got to be smaller than the size of an atom. Okay, back to the question here. There's a charge to mass ratio. We're looking for the radius here, looking for r. We have a speed here of 150,000 meters per second and a magnetic field of 0.5 tesla. We know that fc is equal to fm. We know that mv squared over r equals qvb. V's cancel. mv over r equals q times b. Let's rearrange this to solve for q over m, even though we already have its value. It's the easiest way to plug it in. Okay, the m goes down by dividing. The b goes down by dividing. We get v over br equals q over m. v is 150 times 10 to the 3 meters per second. b is 0 0.50 tesla. R is what we're looking for here. In Q over M, the charge to mass ratio, we already have is 8.04 times 10 to the 6. Let's basically swap places here. The R goes up, the 8.04 goes down. And it starts looking like this. 150 times 10 to the 3 divided by 0.50 times 8.04 times 10 to the 6. 
times 10 to the 6 equals R. When we do that math, it should work out to be 0 0.037. How many people got that one? Good. So it's not a cathode ray tube problem per se. It's a mass spectrometer problem, but it works exactly the same way. All right, you want to know a little bit more about the mass spectrometer? Good, excellent. I'm glad you asked. Because I'm going to have you do a little reading tonight. It's only one page. And then there's three questions to answer on the end of that. Now, listen, it's one page. It's almost nothing. It'll take you five minutes to do. This is what's going to take you the most of the time tonight. And that's uh, page 760. The questions that I want you to do on page 760 are number 1 and 3 to 10. So all of them except for number 2. So you've got 759, 759, the reading, and the three questions that go along with that. And you've also got 760, number 1, and 3 to 10. The reason I'm giving you all these questions here today is because you still got another 15 minutes to work in class here. Okay. Other than that, we're done. Get to work.